Good morning to everyone. Thank you for coming. I am Marcus Comer. I'm the Ag and Natural Resource Specialist for Extension at Virginia State University. And this morning, we are having a first in a series of trainings for the Enviro Atlas Suite, as I call it. It's Enviro Atlas is a, a web-based collection of interactive tools and resources that allows users to explore uh, the benefits that people receive from nature, often such as you know clean water, clean air, recreational, and these things are often referred to as ecosystem services. Um, with the with the Enviro Atlas, I call it the suite because it's there's multiple tools connected to it. And it's all free, it's all online, uh, but it allows you to really dig down and look at the interactions, the linkages between in, in viral, uh, the ecosystem and human health. So you're able to look at features of the built environment, uh, community infrastructure from transportation to waste management, uh, urban use, urban land use. You have all the demographic data that you can that you can get to. Uh, you can make comparisons to air quality in one community versus another community. So it gives you a whole um, lot of data at your fingertips. And this morning we're going to focus on what's called the EJ screen, where we're looking at envir environmental justice related data. And in the chat box, there's a handout that, that you can get to um, that talks about environmental justice, uh, EJ Screen. And we have our presenter today is Mr. Matthew Lee. He is from EPA, and his specialty is EJ Screen. And so I'm going to, first I will ask if there are any questions, um, seeing that we have a small group we can keep this, you know, we can, we, we can talk and, and have some real discussions. Um, so I'm gonna pass it over to Matt. Okay, thank you, Marcus. Um, before I begin, can everyone, first, can everyone hear me and can everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, thank okay, you. Great. Excellent. Um, well, and thank you guys for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, thank you, Marcus, for, for organizing this. Um, uh, I'm very excited. EJ Screen is my specialty. I am um, EJ Screen's point of contact uh, for Region 3. Um, EPA is divided into 10 different regions, um, and Region 3 includes um, Virginia, uh, along with five other, uh, four other states and, and DC. Um, and um, so I am the point of contact for, for Region 3 uh, for EJ Screen. I've been um, utilizing EJ Screen since its inception um, in 2013. And since that point in time, I've conducted um, almost 8,000 individual uh, EJ Screening assessments um, utilizing EJ Screen. Um, and I bring that number up to um, to obviously show my the, the the breadth of experience that I have with the tool, but to also um, show that that we at EPA have truly integrated environmental justice into our daily procedures um, and practices. So you know this is not just me sitting at my computer every day deciding you know which facilities or which communities to you know, to, to conduct DJ screen assessments on. Um, this is requests that I get from my colleagues within the, uh, Region 3 um, for various types of, you know, facilities, communities, grant work, um, you name it. Um, but again, we're, we're doing almost a thousand uh, screens a year. Um, so we really utilize the tool a lot. Um, and because of that, I'm, I'm very familiar uh, with the tool. And I'm very excited to, uh, to show you um, the tool. So EJ Screen is a publicly available website. 
uh, we at EPA and, and the public have access to the same exact website, to the same exact uh, tool, to the same exact data within the tool. There's nothing that you guys have access to, or there's nothing that we have access to that you also don't have access to um, via this tool. And if you were to type um, EJ Screen into your web, web browser, um, the first link that pops up is the EJ Screen homepage. Um, now, EJ Screen, as it says here, is our nationally consistent environmental justice um, screening and mapping tool. And what it does is it combines environmental and demographic data um, in maps and reports. And that's really what sets EJ Screen apart from, let's say, Enviro Atlas. Um, Enviro Atlas is, is an amazing tool and has, I think, hundreds, if not thousands, of, of layers of, of data um, built into built into the tool. Um, but it's really just data point after data point after layer after layer. There's no um, combi combining of, of data sets um, or creating proxy indicators or things like that. Um, and that's what, what EJ Screen does. So that's kind of what it differs, uh, where it differs from, from Enviro Atlas, um, is that you are getting a combination of environmental and demographic data um, in in terms of an EJ index, and I'm gonna go into all this um, in detail. Um, so again, it, the, if you're interested in diving more into um, EJ Screen, which I really hope you are after this, this presentation, um, the homepage is, is a great place to start. There's tons of information about the tool, how it was developed. As I mentioned, um, we've been utilizing the tool in EPA since 2007, um, how we use it, and then, um, you know, if you're if you're interested in where the where the environmental da uh, indicators come from, where the demographic data comes from, how to interpret those reports, um, there is, in the name of transparency, we've made all the data within EJ Screen available for download, um, so you can download it and utilize it within your own GIS if you want to. Um, or you can utilize the web, web browser, which is very nice. And then additionally, there's tons of other resources, frequently asked questions. Um, these EJ Screen videos down here, I think links to about 12 different YouTube videos on a variety of different um, case studies and, and uses of the tool. Um, so I'm gonna give you a primer of it, um, but there is a ton more information available uh, on the website. Um, so if you were to click launch the tool, um, you pop, uh, EJ Screen pops up. Um, and you might immediately notice that it looks very much like Google Maps. Um, and we created it to function very much, very similarly to that, uh, to Google Maps, to Google Earth, um, platforms that people were used to. Um, and so you can see here, you have your, your search, uh, search function, again, very similar. Um, you have, it is its own rudimentary GIS system. Um, so you have, I think, 24 different base maps that you can choose from. Um, and it really depends on what you're looking at uh, with what base map you might wanna uh, choose. In this case, since you know, we're focusing on the greater area around uh, VSU, well, you know, you can use the streets view, but if you're looking at a very specific um, facility, you might want to go hybrid. And um, in that case, you can, you know, go hybrid and get that aerial, aerial and streets view, but it really depends. Um, and I'm going to go with back into this, uh, into the demo, live demo version after my presentation. But I wanted to, to give you a primer of, of what kind of the, the tool looks like. Um, and so you can see kind of the, the ease of the tool. Again, in this search function, you can um, type something as, as non-specific as a state or a city, um, or as, you know, as specific as an address or even a lat long. Um, and then, you know, depending on where you're looking at, you can do a variety of different things that are getting information on the tool. And again, I'm going to go into all this in a, in a second. Um, but first, I do want to give you the, the formal um, 
the formal presentation. And again, if, if you do have questions, I can always follow up with this, um, but also presentations very similar to this are available on that website. Um, let me start this up. Um, so I mentioned this, this is our uh, nationally consistent EJ screening tool. So everybody in the, in the US um, is, it, or at EPA rather, is it util, utilizing the same exact tool um, and it is available to anybody. So it doesn't have to just be the United States. Um, anybody with internet access can, can access the tool. And what the tool does is it combines environmental and demographic data to highlight areas where vulnerable populations may be disproportionately impacted by pollution. And that right there gets at the crux of environmental justice. Vulnerable populations, poor, minority, linguistically isolated populations who may be disproportionately impacted by pollution. And that's what uh, EJ Screen does. You have the environmental information, the environmental indicators, and you have the demographic indicators. Um, I always have to, to mention limitations. Um, a lot of these limitations are more for, for internal uses, um, but EJ Screen is a screening tool, right? This is not going to give you um, the exact makeup of the, the block around of a, of a facility or you know, the area that you're looking to do work in. Um, it's a screening tool. The census is a screening, you know, is a screening survey. Um, it doesn't get at everybody. This utilizes census data. So this is not a perfect tool. Um, it is a pre-decisional tool for EPA. We do not make any decisions or, uh, or direct outcomes based on this tool. Um, it simply highlights areas for further review for, uh, for the potential of EJ concerns. Um, as, I, as I will show you, EJ Screen does offer information on 11 different environmental indic indicators, but they do not cover every single possible environmental issue that a community may be facing. Um, we are always going to want to supplement this information with local, uh, you know, with more local information and experience. Um, and if you come away with nothing else from this presentation, EJ Screen does not identify EJ communities. EPA does not have a definition of what an EJ community is. Um, knowing that, e that communities, there is no set boundary for what a community is. Um, a lot of the boundaries we use, is, we use are political boundaries. We realize that community boundaries do not necessarily adhere to, to those boundaries. Um, and then the nature of communities um, vary drastically. Um, so you can't put, in our in EPA's opinion, you can't put generic thresholds of if it meets X percent minority or X percent low income, we're calling it uh, an EJ community. Um, that's not what this tool does. Again, it simply highlights areas for the further review for, for the potential of EJ concerns. Um, now that we've gotten the limitations over with, we do have a very, very powerful tool in my opinion. And especially when you're doing screening level assessments on areas of interest or on communities, EJ Screen is a great way to give you um, a very efficient, efficient way of giving you a ton of information on, um, on a community or your area of interest. Um, so the key features of the tool, EJ Screen features 11 different EJ indices, um, one for each of the environmental indicators, which I'll go into in a second. It features annually updated demographics, and these are, these are pulled from the American Community Survey. The American, American Community Survey um, is released by the Census Bureau, and it runs on five-year averages. Um, so again, these, these dem demographics are updated annually. As I've mentioned before, it's web accessible. You do not need any special GIS software to, to utilize or access the tool. Um, it gives you information in a variety of different ways and gives you the ability to download that information um, in the name of transparency. And it's at a higher resolution than, than our previous tools. 
Uh, so everything in EJ screen is generated at the block group level. Um, so each one of these, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, um, but each one of these little, you know, irregularly shaped polygons uh, on this maps, you know, depending on the color, those are block groups. Um, so block groups very much do vary in size. Um, there are over 200,000 block groups in the United States. Um, and a block group is the most refined level for which the Census Bureau releases demographic data. So it doesn't get more refined than this. Um, an average block group is about 1,400 residents. Uh, we've seen as low as 300 residents, or um, once you get past about 3,000 residents, usually you're talking about a census tract. Um, but again, 1,400 is the average, and it doesn't get more refined than that. So we're, we're dealing with um, the best demographic data available. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine, when you're dealing with a densely populated area, like a, a city or an urban area, block groups can be very small, um, literally a single city block. You know, you're getting that 1,400 people. In your more rural areas, block groups can be extraordinarily large um, and span over 10 miles. Uh, so, so you do, and EJ screen visual, visualizes that, so you can you can see that. But just just keep that in mind. These are not uniform um, boundaries. And again, these these are census designated areas with the goal of getting that average amount of residents, not focusing on community cohesion or this is, you know, this is this type of neighborhood and this is that type of neighborhood. Um, and that is not taken into account when designated block groups. Um, so again, you can, um, you know, know that these are political boundaries. These are not necessarily, you know, community or neighborhood boundaries. Um, also EJ screen, so everything is ranked as percentiles. Um, the, all these block groups, and you can also draw buffer rings around the block groups or, or you know, user drawn areas to incorporate multiple block groups. And I'll go through that uh, during the live demo. Um, but then once you decide on your, your area of interest, whether it be a block group or, or a buffer ring or whatever user defined area, your results are ranked in percentiles. And what that does is put everything in common units of, of zero to 100. Um, so, for example, if, if something, if, if your block group is in the 80th percentile nationally for, for percent minority, that means that only 20% of the U.S. has a higher percent minority uh, than that block group. Um, and we think percentiles is a really powerful way um, to kind of, prior, especially in prioritizing areas of, to, to work in, um, because it does allow you to compare um, first of all, compare indicators with, with different units, but then also compare areas um, to each other. So we can compare a single block group to, um, to those percentiles in the state or the region, the EPA region, or, or nationally. Um, and that's built into the tool. So, so that's, a, that's a powerful aspect of the tool. You can get all your raw data if you want. Um, that is also available, um, but putting this in percentiles allows for, for easy, uh, easy comparison. Um, so I mentioned these, these EJ indexes, and I'm going to come back to this, this uh, components of EJ indices multiple times. So this is, this is just a primer um, because I haven't even gone into each one of these individual components yet. But understand that these are the different components that go into that calculation of the EJ index. You're gonna take a single environmental indicator. I'm gonna go over those in a second. You're gonna multiply that by how different the, EJ, the demographic index is from the national average. And then you're gonna multiply that by the population of the block group. And that's going to give you an EJ index for each environmental indicator. So you're actually going to have an EJ index for 11 different environmental indicators for every single block group in the United States. And again, 
then you can compare those block groups or the areas of interest to national, regional, or state percentiles. Um, so I'm going to go back to this slide once I go through each component, but um, uh, bear with me for a second. So these are the environmental indicators that are built into the tool. Again, we have 11 of them, and they really do span the gamut of, of potential environmental issues that a community may be facing, whether that they be air, toxics, water, um, you know, those type of those type of issues. And you can see the first uh, the first five are, are mostly air related. Um, and all this information, is, the metadata behind this is available on the website. So if you have questions on how these environmental indicators are calculated or the year it's published or what it's actually measuring, um, all that is available on the website. Um, and, and I'll show you how to easily access that in the tool. Um, you also have a lead paint indicator um, that is a simply pre-1960 housing. Um, you have a traffic proximity indicator, and then you have three uh, indicators which um, relate to proximity to EPA regulated facilities. So proximity to Superfund sites, proximities to facilities with risk management plans, those are usually going to be your chemical storage facilities, and then proximity to hazardous waste facilities. Um, and then last, and this is one of the newly updated um, indicators, we have a wastewater discharger indicator. Um, and that is based on a combination of proximity to um, NIPTES majors um, and RECI modeling. Um, and I am not going to pretend that I know exactly what those elements are. Um, I'm more of an expert in the utilization of, of EJ screen, not necessarily the data in between each, each environmental indicator. Um, but like I said, all that data is, is linked um, within the website. And if you do have individual questions about data, um, we have a, uh, an email set up that I could, ejscreen at, at epa.gov, um, that you can ask those types of questions. You can also ask them of me and I will, uh, to me, and I will get you to the right person. Um, but these are the environmental indicators. So again, each one of these is a, it becomes a single component of that EJ index. So you're going to have an EJ index for each one of these environmental indicators. So again, it's going to, the, the EJ index is going to take one of those indicators, multiply that by how different the demographic index, which I'm going to go into next, is from the, from the U.S. average, and then multiply that by the population of the block group. The demographic index is a very, very simple calculation. And what this goes back to is President Clinton's, a former President Clinton's executive order on environmental justice, right, which specifically identified low income and minority populations. Um, so, so um, that, and that executive order directed environment, federal agencies um, to address in, uh, EJ. Um, so we took that, as, you know, directly from, from the executive order to incorporate low income and, and minority populations. So the, um, in that component, the demographic index is, um, is percent low income plus percent minority divided by two. And when you take that in, in the overall calculation of the EJ index, we're multiplying that by how different that demographic index is from the national average. If you're interested, I believe the national average for that demographic index, percent minority plus percent poverty, is um, I think it's 36 percent. Um, and then multiply that by the, the population of the black group, as I mentioned. Um, so that those are the main component, those are the components of the EJ indices. So what are we trying to do with the EJ indices, right? Why are we, why are we doing those calculations? Is that we are, are combining that information to, as I said at the beginning, to highlight areas where vulnerable populations, low income and minority populations may be disproportionately impacted by pollution. Another way to say the same exact thing is that it highlights areas that may have higher pollution burdens and vulnerable populations present. Um, so again, that's where that's where this kind of differs from Enviro Atlas 
in that Enviro Atlas, you can get at all this environmental information, all those environmental indicators, but you can only get them by themselves. There's not that combination with the demographic index or with any of the demographic in information um, that kind that gives you these EJ indices. Um, there is a bunch of different ways that you can view the information. Um, when you are looking at a single area, like a, a facility or a, a community playground that might be associated with a grant or something like that, um, the standard report is a very powerful way to generate three pages of environmental and demographic data on a, on a certain area. Um, but if you're looking at a wider area, like, you know, the area around the VSU, for example, that I used in the demo, um, you know, the maps, the web application uh, might be where you want to, uh, to focus on. Um, but it, again, it really depends on, on what you're utilizing the tool for. Um, you can also not use the web browser. You can download the information and utilize it within your own GIS. So again, there's a ton of different ways to utilize um, the, the EJ screen uh, information and data. Um, so the three page standard report, and I'll show you some of these that I that I've pre generated. Um, but the first page shows you those I don't know if you can see my my um, cursor, but it shows you those 11 EJ indices in tabular format, how they compare to the state regional and national average, the same exact information in bar graph format. So your 11 different EJ indices and how they compare to the state, regional, and national averages. On the second page of your report, it's going to be a map of your area of interest. This is basically going to be a screenshot of what you were looking at at the web application. And then on the third page of your report is going to be all your raw data. So your environmental indicators on their own. Um, not combined with the demographic data or the pop population to form that EJ index just by itself. Similarly, the um, demographic data available by, by itself. Um, so, and these standard reports you can generate once you're in the tool, you can generate with two clicks of a mouse. So this is a very um, user-friendly way to get at a lot of information and very quickly. Um, I mentioned everything is available at the block group level. That is the most refined um, level that, that the information is available at. But we also realize that block groups may not be your area of interest. Um, I mentioned those are just census designated areas. It's not necessarily going to align with your community of interest or your, your area of interest. Um, so in, uh, to make it as user friendly as possible, um, we allowed that the user themselves can generate your own area of interest. Um, so in this case, let's say you're looking at a facility and you just wanted to put, you know, a, a half mile radius around the facility. You could easily do that. Um, in this case, and, I, and I'm, I'm not saying this is the case, but let's say you have a facility um, you know, in, in the middle of this irregular polygon right here, and you have a plume of pollution that's coming off from that, from that site, and you know where that, that is. You could actually draw that, that plume of pollution, you know, on the site, or, or on the, um, the web application, rather. And then, you know, we, we um, part of what we do at EPA is review projects, you know, NEPA-related projects, transportation-related projects, so let's say we have a project like that that's going to be, you know, working on a on a highway corridor. Um, the, you know, this particular example out in Salt Lake City, um, you know, highway there, and you could actually select your highway segment and then draw a half mile buffer around that segment. Um, you same thing with like a stream segment if you're looking at an impaired waterway. Um, so it really depends on what you're looking for but you can generate information on a variety of different areas, um, which, is, which is really powerful. Um, so the primary information within EJ screen are those environmental and demographic data sets, um, and of course the, the EJ in indices themselves. Um, 
But as I mentioned, and as you probably saw real quick at the beginning, it is its own rudimentary GIS system and has its own GIS library. Um, it is not as robust as the Enviro Atlas. Um, we purposely made it not as robust as the Enviro Atlas. Um, the Enviro Atlas, in my opinion, is really good when you know what you're looking for. Otherwise, it can get very overwhelming. Um, so while we did add in a lot of different layers into EJ screen, um, we did not add in everything that is available in, in Enviro Atlas, and these are more of your uh, community-based layers, the EPA and community-based layers, if, uh, if you will. And I'll, and I'll show you what some of those are. Um, so before I want to go, before I go into the demo, um, we at EPA uh, uh, utilize the tool in a variety of, of different ways. Um, I mentioned those, the EJ assessments or the analyses that I do on individual sites, um, almost 8,000 in, in the last uh, seven plus years. So we're doing a lot of, a lot of those uh, individual analyses. Um, but we also utilize the, the information within EJ screen for, for prior to, to community outreach. Um, you know, we just had a, uh, some public meetings at a facility outside of a facility in Philadelphia, where on one side of the facility, um, the primary language spoken other than English was Spanish. And on the other side of the facility, the primary language other than English spoken was um, was different Asian uh, languages, you know, primarily Chinese. Um, and we were able to identify that via EJ screen. Um, so we were able to go out to those community meetings already knowing and having documents translated, you know, um, so, you know, we knew what type of community to, to expect, which is, which is really powerful to not to go into an area of blind. Um, you know, we can also utilize it for uh, evaluating place space work and then um, retrospective reporting this is more for your enforcement base work. But we could say, for example, that, um, you know, X number of, of inspections that we did um, for the, you know, the RRP, the lead paint, the renovation repair and paint rule um, were in areas of potential EJ concern. Um, and maybe we want to, for the following fiscal year, we want to increase that, that percentage. Um, so there we can utilize it for, for retrospective reporting. Um, but this is just the way that EPA utilizes the tool. Uh, and we are constantly, you know, VSU isn't the only university that's, that's gotten EJ screen um, training, and it is certainly not the only university that's been utilizing EJ screen or has students um, and faculty utilizing EJ screen. Um, we've had people utilizing EJ screen from everything from criminal justice projects to, ver to specific health outcome based projects um, to more recently to, to COVID um, related pro outcomes and, and projects. Um, so, so it really just, uh, it really just depends. And what's proven nicely is that EJ screen really does, for a screening level tool, really does fit nicely for kind of those variety of different uses. Um, so I will, let me pause there um, and I want to, then I'll go into the live demo, which I think will, will help visualize this a little bit better. Um, but I do want to pause there and especially because we have a, a small group you know, are there any questions uh, before I go move forward? Okay, let's, um, let's continue on. Um, so, you know, I mentioned a lot of this, this before, um, but, you know, as you can see, it is very similar to, you know, to Google Earth, uh, to Google Maps, or if if you do have an, an Esri account, you know, uh, an ArcGIS um, account, this is very similar to the stuff you're going to see on the geo platform. So that, that depends on your, your, you know, your level of expertise with GIS. But what's really nice is that you don't have to have any expertise with GIS to, to utilize um, this, this tool. Uh, I mentioned the base maps already. 
The bookmarks are if you have um, a ton of information, you've layered on a ton of, of data points um, and you're gonna go away for a little bit, you can actually save your session. So all that information will be there for you. Um, the measure uh, is nice, um, you know, again, rudimentary GIS system. If you wanted to see, uh, and I'm totally making this up, but you know, how far Roger Stadium is from, uh, you know, from the from the canal, you know, roughly a mile, um, you know, that comes into play when you're looking at facilities and their proximity to, to waterways and things like that. Um, but there's a variety of different reasons to have a measure tool. Um, print is is really nice because now you can create maps uh, in the web application. Prior to I think two versions ago. Um, you had to do screenshots, not aesthetically pleasing. You know, now you can create your own maps, um, have the title, the different format, um, you know, all types of different ish, uh, information um, that you can have on there. So you can create maps directly from the web application, which is which is really nice. Uh, clear selected is again, that's just your erase button. And then your two mo the two most powerful radio buttons are right here, are your add maps and select location. Um, so again, add maps is really, um, this is, if you're a GIS person, these are, these are layers, they're not actually maps. Um, but I think in the name of trying to get this to the lay person, they're, they're calling them maps. Um, <clears throat> and this is, these are really powerful when you're looking at, you know, larger, areas. Um, when you know a specific site, um, you know, the, the select location or, or report on known geography is, is really nice. Um, so I actually had um, relatively no knowledge of VSU or where it was. Um, and as you can probably imagine, when you're doing 8,000 individual EJ screens, I get a lot of sites that are exactly like that. I've never heard of them. I don't know where they're at. Um, and so EJ Screen is actually a great point, uh, great place to start. Um, so I just wanted to see, you know, some very general information about the area that contains um, VSU. And if you were to come over here in your report on known geography, you have a bunch of different options, but you can select a variety of different things. We're going to select the city, and I just wanted to see the area that that contains, um, you know, VSU. And now in this case, it's um, it's going to be a little bit separate from from Petersburg, uh, but they're you know, they're um, calling this the now I don't even actually know how to pronounce this etric etric, um, and CDB is is census designated place. Right, so this is not necessarily a city, but this is a census designated place. Nonetheless, you can get um, EJ screen information generated on this area. Um, now, understand that this is a, a, re a relatively large, you know, large area. We're talking about from that, you know, it's, a, a, you know, over three miles, three miles long, um, but nonetheless, if you wanted to generate your, you know, information on that um, census designated place, you could click submit and here um, pops up a couple of different options. You can explore reports that's going to uh, give you your, your, your information, your bar graph, your tabular information right on your, your, web, your web screen or you can then download PDF versions of your standard 3D page EJ screen report, which I talked about, or your American Community Survey report, which is actually um, a little more specific, and I'll, and I'll show you the differences here. So I've pre-downloaded these, these reports for you. Um, and so this is for that, that larger census designated place, and let me get this out of here for a second. And this is your three page EJ screen report. So you can see um, your information on your 11 different EJ indexes and how it compares to the state, regional, and US percentiles. And these percentiles are actually are, are pretty high. 
um, you know, this is, let's say, for, for um, waste, you know, for proximity to RMP uh, facilities, 93rd percentile in the state. That means for that EJ index, only three, or sorry, only 7% of Virginia has a higher proximity um, to RMP facilities. Um, so, you know, again, relatively high, um, you know, high percentages for, the, for these EJ indexes. And you can see that um, on your EJ screen report. We are talking about a relatively large area, 5,500 people. Um, again, that same information in, in uh, bar graph format. Third page of your report is going to be your area of interest. And then down here, you're going to get your, on the third page, your environmental information and your demographic information on its own. Um, I'll focus on the demographic information. You know, you can see the area around uh, VSU, 76% minority, 34% low income, you know, both vastly exceeding the, the state average. Um, linguistic isolation doesn't seem to be that, that big of an, uh, of an issue in the area. Um, so again, so this is your standard EJ screen report, very powerful, but let's say you wanted to go in a little bit more and, and start analyzing that community, and that's where your American Community Survey report can, can come into, um, you know, can be beneficial. And let me go back here. Um, so this is your American Community Survey report for that same exact area. Um, and you can see 76% um, minority, which we, which we already knew, but what's nice about this is that then this is going to give you your breakdown by race. Um, so you can see that 5% of that population is Hispanic, 24% uh, are, are white, and 68% are, are black. Um, you might want to take it a step further. I mentioned that example of the facility outside of, of Philadelphia where we were finding those linguistic isolation issues. On the third page of that uh, report of the American community, or sorry, on the second page of the American Community Survey report, you're going to get information on linguistic isolation. Um, so again, as I mentioned, in this case, actually, non-English at home is not that that high linguistic isolation doesn't seem to be that big of an issue in the area, but of the linguistically isolated households, you can see the breakdown. Um, you know, 70% are speaking Spanish, and the other 30% are speaking um, Asian and Pacific Island uh, languages. You can see from from EPA's perspective, or really from anybody doing community work, this can be invaluable information to have before you go out to a community. You know, the community themselves are, are, gonna, are already gonna know this information. But if, if especially we as EPA, if we've done our homework and can find this information out ahead of time, you know, that makes um, relationships a lot easier to, to develop. Um, and on just to, to continue with this ACS um, report on the third page, it actually breaks down um, you know, by population uh, or the language spoken at home. Um, so you can see the different, the different languages spoken at home within that area. Um, now, that area is, is relatively big. 5,500 people, when you're trying to, to, um, to identify potentially vulnerable communities or potentially underrepresented communities, Sometimes they can be diluted out within those within those um, you know larger areas. In this case, that's not actually the the case. Um, but if you're familiar with Philadelphia at all, for example, um, right outside of Philadelphia is Delaware County. Delaware County is a very affluent um, majority white community. Right, but within Delaware, so when you look at Delaware County in EJ screen, right, it's those percentiles that I was showing you are, you know, these these percentiles are completely different than than these. They're they're down at the in the ten, in, you know, ten percent. Um, but that's for the the entire county, right? 
But if you looked at the city of Chester, right, and if you're familiar at all with environmental justice history, the city of Chester is, is one of the is one of the case studies you you would learn about. The city of Chester is in Delaware County, right, and it has percentiles that actually exceed this area. Um, so looking at these scale, geographic scale is always important to to consider. Um, so county level demographics, even these larger, you know, 5,000 plus demographics may not be as specific as you're looking for um, when you're when you're trying to identify specific communities. And that's where your block group level assessments can can really come um, into play. So in this case, what I'll show you is, let's say you wanted to focus on the block group you know, which contains Virginia State University. So again, I came in here, I selected the location, select location, this um, window pops up and it gives you a variety of different options here, um, but you can also just select the block group. Um, and you can see in this case, this is the block group which contains um, VSU, Right, and again, those those same different options. You can get your printable standard report, um, which again I have pre-generated. And in this case, so this is going to be for that for that particular block group. You can now see we're talking about a much more refined, you know, refined level of community, 1,700 people, um, and you know the percentiles changed actually drastically. Um, so you know. 95th hundredth percentile for lead paint indicator. Um, obviously, the area around VSU has, has a you know has aging housing um, and vulnerable populations present. That's part of the EJ index. Um, but you know this is that's obviously a very big big issue around around the area. You know, and if we were further to break this down, you can see a hundred percent of of that block group is reporting as as low income or is considered low income rather and then ninety eight percent is is reporting as as a minority um, you know the, those percentiles don't they basically doesn't get any higher than that um, and and these this is very powerful information to have especially via a desktop um, you know a desktop screening tool um, so you might say, okay, that's fine. Like now, yeah, we're in the hundredth percentile for for lead paint, um, or you know, for for R and P proximity, ninetieth percentile. Now what? Um, well, one of the things you can do is start seeing kind of what's what's driving that those factors. Um, and if you were to let me clear this out. If you were to come in here and you can add in your additional layers, right? You can see your sites reporting to EPA. Move you guys over here. And these are going to be your different sites reporting to EPA. Um, but you can see your different, your, your different toxic releases and your dischargers um, that, are, that are coming up around you know VSU. Now I know VSU itself has, um, you know, has its own uh, has its own oops, has its own air permit. Let me get this out of here. Sorry, I have to delete this. Um, has its own air permit, so you could actually click on that um, individual facility, right, and get a bunch of information on that air permit themselves. That self. So you could actually visit the the, the URL of that um, that facility and get a lot of information. Um, but that's probably not that interesting. I think it's just a broil, a broiler uh, on site. Um, but maybe you wanted to check out the, the the closest wastewater treatment plant and figure out you know some of their um, you know some of their compliance history and things like that. You can do that via the via the tool, which is really nice. Um, so this is this particular uh, facility has an air permit um, and a water permit, um, and this you know gives you a bunch of information. But down at the bottom is the facility URL, and you can click on that facility URL, 
and again, getting a ton more information about that individual facility. Um, so you can get its, NIP, its NIPTES ID. Um, this then you could utilize um, to then search, as I mentioned, another tool that EPA has is um, Enforcement and Compliance History Online. So if you are interested in the enforcement nature of a facility or of facilities within your area, you can come in here and utilize this tool. Um, but we could utilize that same ID number Oops, didn't work. I think that's the state um, ID. Shoot, of course it didn't work. Um, let me see here. Hmm, I don't know why that wouldn't have worked. It should be there. But anyways, you can actually search and get a ton of, of enforcement and compliance information um, about that specific facility. But it's also in here um, in, in the EnviroFax uh, a portion um, and you can see the different, um, you know, the different outfall schedules, um, the different, you know, their, their limits, um, what they're releasing, things like that. So again, very powerful if you're looking at uh, the different facilities in and around, um, in and around a given area. Um, so that's how you can get information on, on specific facilities. I'm going to turn that off for the moment. Um, I did kind of pass over the, the EJ screen maps. Um, so if you are looking at, you know, sometimes we're, we as EPA are prioritizing areas for, for place-based work, right? And maybe let, let's say actually that, that lead paint, um, you know, we, we wanted to do some lead paint in the area around Petersburg, but we didn't know exactly where to go. This is where you, you, you looking at a wider area and adding on some of the lead paint and you know, some of the environmental indicators can be very powerful. So you can see, now this is simply your environmental indicators, right? So this is for, for lead paint. So this is simply your percent pre-1960 housing. And you can see that obviously the area around VSU for pre-1960 housing uh, is in the 95th to 100th percentile. So almost all of the, of the housing around v, VSU is pre-1960. Um, you can utilize that, you can view that same information with the EJ index if you wanted to. Um, and you can see it, it, it changes a little bit because now you're adding in your, your vulnerable population information. Um, same thing with, let's say you wanted to look at the EJ index for, for RMP proximity, um, and you can see how those, you know, how those different, you know, maps and especially the color scheme schemes um, change depending on the different indicators that you're looking at. Um, what I'll also show you here, and in, in it actually it might look drastic on this map, but some um, is the importance between U.S. and state comparisons. Um, so the U.S. average, right, as I mentioned, for that demographic index is, I think, approximately 30, 36 or 39 um, percent. So when you are comparing a state where that is very different than that, like let's say West Virginia, for example, West Virginia, the average percent minority is 8 percent. In the United States, the average percent minority is 39%. So obviously when you're comparing the state, uh, when you're comparing sites in West Virginia to the national averages, those are gonna be underrepresented because they do not have the percent minority, right, that, um, that other areas have, that city of Philadelphia has, for example. But when you compare West Virginia to West Virginia or a site within West Virginia and West Virginia, you get a better story in my opinion. Um, so again, now watch how these numbers, these maps change when you compare from the US for RMP proximity to state, you can see more areas are highlighted, um, you know, as, as being in higher percentiles, um, 
for R and pre proximity for that EJ index. So again, you have to, you know, just be cognizant of, you know, not everything is going to be is appropriate to compare to the national average. Um, you might want to come in here and compare to the state, and it it really does, you know, differ at, at what you're looking at, um, or change change what you're looking at. Um, I will briefly go into um, some of the other layers that are built into the tool. Um, oh, well, in actually a perfect segue to that, as I mentioned, the, the state versus national comparison is doing the side by side comparisons. And what's really nice is that you can do exactly that. Um, so this is actually how I should have uh, should have done this for you guys but so national level ej index rm pre proximity ej screen maps state level rm pre proximity and you can see how the, how how they change um again in a state in in virginia yes this, this they did change um and pretty vastly but in, in West Virginia, you're looking at completely different maps. Um, so we, we do hear a lot. I don't know how familiar you guys are with EJ Screen. Um, EJ Screen isn't that great at identifying, you know, rural areas. Um, and, and that's one of the, this is one of the reasons is because of that national comparison thing. But if you go beyond the national comparison and start looking at state comparisons, right, which is built right into the tool, um, I actually think it is pretty good at, at identifying rural areas, especially because then you can you can still break it down for you know you can still break down the demographics further. Um, so um, that's the side by side maps. Again, you can break down um, get more demographic information if you wanted. Uh, for example, now. Linguistic isolation, as we already know, is, is not that big of an area issue in this particular area. Maybe outside the area, it is. Um, so there is one particular block group in, in, in Petersburg where about 10% of, of the population is, is linguistically isolated. And if we wanted, we could come in here and generate a, you know, American Community Survey report on that block group and figure out, you know, the primary language that that um, the, that block, particular block group um, is speaking. Um, so that's in this is access in the more demographics. You really do have access to tons of different. You have access to the entire American Community Survey. So it's uh, you could get lost in here. And this is where this does become a little bit like the Enviro Atlas just for demographic information, um, but there's just so much in here. You need to know what you're looking for, um, but the entire American Community Survey is built into EJ Screen, so, so you could access that if you wanted. Um, you can also, as I mentioned, it is a, a GIS library. I showed you the, the, the sites reporting to EPA, um, but there's a bunch of different other layers. And again, these are more of your community layers right like this isn't as powerful as um it's not that it's not as powerful it isn't as robust as enviro atlas in terms of of data um because we wanted to focus on on more of your your community-based uh, layers if you will so you have information on schools um you know you can you can map out where the different schools are in the area in this it's, it's a little hard to see you might want to change your um you know change your base map in in that case you know, and you can and you can see, uh, you know, where the schools are in the area. Um, another nice option is, especially if you're doing community-based work, you can see if EJ, if any EJ grants, uh, EPA grants were issued in in and around your area of interest. Now, in in Petersburg, there there doesn't seem to be, but if we zoom out for, far enough, we'll we'll find one. Um, there's there's one. This is actually a Brownfields grant, um, but nonetheless, you could still then come in here and get information on that uh, that particular grant. Um, you know what its purpose was. You know the project. 
um, and you know different different points of contact information. Um, let's see if I can find one for EJ grants. And what's nice about why I focus on the EJ grants is that if you're doing community work, right, it's nice to go out and work with the community groups who are already kind of um, you know established or receiving federal dollars. Um, you know, those are great first uh, first partners. Um, and unfortunately, it looks like we're there's not too many uh, in this area. I'm gonna I'm gonna zoom out until I find one. There's a couple. Um, so this one down in um, in West Point, uh, and you can see some of the. This is for the the Mattapanai, uh, the Indian tribe there, um, and they're doing some some monitoring. Um, and you could, or, or were doing back in, in 99, um, but you could see what they, they are doing. And, um, you know, so if you wanted to do some community work, you might want to reach out to, to the Mattapanai or, you know, if you're doing stuff up in Richmond, see what some of these, these groups are, are working out um, and doing in Richmond. Um, you know, take that, that, that community group, just Google them. You know, you can find out a lot of information. Um, so I will pretty much end there. We we do also have access to anything that's in the geo platform. Um, so this does again make it more even more powerful and more user friendly um, to get to get geo platform information. There is so much on the geo platform. Um, this is just some of the stuff that that I've added in. Um, one of the new things that that you guys may have heard of are these these opportunity zones, um, you know, and and where you know where those opportunity zones are, um, and actually you can see you know that um, that VSU is actually in a, in an opportunity zone, um, and and different investors might be you know might be interested in information uh, like that, um, so. I will basically end the formal presentation there. I wanted to open it up for questions and um, and we can also just search through stuff you know live as we're going, especially since there's a small group, um, you know look at different areas if you want or different aspects of the tool. but um, I'll open it up. Well, Matt, I have a question. Uh, do you have some tutorial case studies put together that we could use to, to dig into it further? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, we have in the additional resources on the homepage, um, I will show you uh, some of what's, you know, so again, Obviously, all the technical the, the information, um, the different user guides, the fact sheet, which I think I sent you uh, previously, right. but then um, some of the different tutorials are, where are they? They're in, oh, EJ Screen videos. Right, and these are more actually just PowerPoints. Um, so basically tutorials of, of different aspects of, you know, the, the overview, the different uses, how to, you know, to, to interpret standard results, kind of like just more um, specific knowledge about the different areas that I gave you a general info um, on. Uh, but this is the closest thing that uh, that we would have to to these you know tutorials. Okay. okay. Thank you very much for this. It was quite informative. I was wondering if uh, I've been uh, doing a project lately on on uh, I guess what's generically called food deserts, and uh, could you? Uh huh. How would you, I guess, would you have any pointers of how to go about maybe approaching it uh, with the EJ screen? Thank you. Yeah, so 
uh, food insecurity is something we're, we're certainly working on, and I actually think we're, we're trying to um, add in some different data layers uh, specifically related to food insecurity in the next version of, of EJ Screen. Um, so we don't have anything built in right now specific to, to food insecurity, um, but, you know, food deserts, food insecurity, a lot of that is kind of determined locally and once you've determined those those areas um then you can utilize ej screen to kind of identify the characteristics of the community around you know around those or in those um those food deserts uh but yeah like city of chester for example i mean it's hard to imagine a, a city being being a food desert but the entire city doesn't have a, an actual grocery store um you know and and this is that you can't determine that you can't see that via ej screen you have to have known that anecdotally um but you know once you know that then you could analyze you know the area um utilizing ej screen but yeah wait till wait till the next version where we will have um you know, food insecurity information. Also, the 2020 version is going to have. I don't want to. Don't want to say it wrong. I think it's it's either six or twelve. I think it's six. I'll just I'll undercount. It's six different um, climate change indicators. Um, so we're going to have flooding information and and other um, you know climate resiliency uh, type indicators built into the tool for for next um, for the next version. Uh, so all these are you know those are great great questions to ask, and we love to hear kind of those examples of oh I, I'm working on food deserts, how can we utilize the tool for that? You know while we might not have an answer for you right now like i don't i can say you know were you looking into it or i can go to headquarters and be like hey i'm getting questions about this you know about this type of use you know we had never really envisioned it being utilized in a criminal justice standpoint but when that professor came to us we're like yeah that, this makes sense um let's you know let's utilize it that way um so yeah that i think that's a great point um it is something that is currently lacking in in the tool um but we're trying to get that data in there so so dan i just posted ers has a food desert map um that you could use and then you could kind of pull pull those pull the data together so you could use ej screen to look at the characteristics of what you're finding in of uh, the data from the ers map so i just stuck that in the chat box Oh, okay. Oh, okay. And if that, it, yep. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no. Just yeah. Thank you very much. That sounds great. Appreciate it. Um, and that's exactly uh, as Marcus was saying. You know, if you have it, if there is a a layer, um, I never know if I spelled desert right. <laughs> but you can you can search the geo platform and see what else is what is what else is out there. And I'm unfamiliar with that with that ERS um, acronym, but anyways, you could. Um, oh, this is so county population percent affected by food deserts in Virginia. You can see there's actually a lot out there now. This is not EPA tool. Uh, this is not EPA information. This is, um, I guess, from William and Mary. Somebody put that information on there. Um, but again, you can search the geo platform and see what else is available and add that into to EJ screen. Um, thank you. So when you say um, that they can add that into the screen, uh, you can import. So for example, you could import that ERS information into the EPA screen? Is that possible? Yes, exactly. So in this case, let's look at this. So we have um, populations. Yeah, why not? Let's use this one. Let's just see what it looks like. Let's turn off the qualified opportunity zones. Uh, let's 
let's see, I'm operating on the fly here, so bear with me. And I might have to zoom out. I don't know why it's taking so long. Let's see, why isn't it? I don't know why it is not generating here. Let's see, no, that's not it. There might be something wrong with that particular layer. Let me. Let's see if there's. Trying to see which one of these would be a good one to food access by census track. Well, let's, let's see what that looks like. Now, for some reason, EJ screen just got real slow. Let me add, get all this out of here. Huh failing on me of course during <laughs> during the live demo <laughs> i don't know why that's not working um that's the one i added let's let's try this one well, well while we're um, working on that i also had a um another question if i may um mm -hmm. and uh, this is uh, actually um separate Excuse me. And I was having internet problems. That's why I was in and out. So I apologize to the group um, for this question. If you already covered it, um, I noted when you did the side by side maps, national versus state. Could you explain again why those are different? Why, you know, you click on one and it'll, it'll show a different kind of comparison. What's the reason for that, please? Because when you're comparing the national averages, um, that's going to be the national average of that demographic index. Um, mm -hmm. So for, for the entire nation, I think that the percent minority plus percent low income divided by two is, um, is 36%, I believe, right? So when you're comparing it to national percentiles, that's going to be compared to thir how different the block group is from 36%. But when you're comparing at the state level, right, mm -hmm. in West Virginia, for example, it's very different. So you might be comparing how different that demographic is from 8%. Okay. Right. So that's where, that's where you're going to get that, that difference. Okay. Um, it's, it depends on the demographic index of, of the particular state compared to uh, the national average. Okay. Thank you very much. And I, this particular layer is, is not um, is not working, and I'm not for sure exactly why. Um, but nonetheless, you should be able to add in information, um, you know, like that. Yeah. So that uh, that inform most of that information is from from ARC. So you can seamlessly add ARC data into EJ screen. Am I correct? Correct. Yes, yes, you exactly you you could do that. And and also, again, you could do the, the reverse. Also, if you had you could, um, you know, import EJ screen information into into arc or into your own, you know, into your own GIS uh, system, it, it really just depends. Um, you know, if, if you're using kind of EJ screen as your denominator, if you will, of like that's that's going to be the, the majority of the stuff that you're looking at and layering on, the web application is awesome. If you're looking to generate like just the EJ indexes on and put them on top of all your other information that you have, 
you know, download DJ, DJ screen information and, and utilize it within your own GIS. That, you know, that's probably the best way to go. Um, I have one more question. Um, you mentioned uh, criminal justice as a part of this map. Can you just show me really quick where you would yeah. access that? Oh, okay. So, sorry. Um, criminal justice is not actually part of this this map. It was just simply that a um, a professor at uh, Lincoln University, actually outside of Philly, um, was going to utilize EJ Screen. Um, in his criminal justice class, and I think he was trying to find the linkage between, um, you know, poor and minority uh, populations, you know, and um, and different, you know, criminal justice attributes. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure what he was looking at, but um, that was just one of the the examples of the uses of of the information within the tool. There oh, isn't any. Um, criminal justice information built into the tool. Okay, thank you. Now, I, I know that I've talked with some others who have been using Enviro Atlas to look at um, natural resources and comparing that to where crimes occur because they're, they're showing that the more environmental, the more natural environment that people live in, it, you have less crime. So there are people that are studying that. So I know they're using Enviro Atlas to do that. So that kind of gets at some point you were, was just yeah. asking. Thank you yeah. very much. Yep, exactly. There's there's all types of, of linkages, um, and some are some unfortunate, and but some just um, you know even just reality based. Um, one some of the work we've been working on, and I'll go back to um, to my presentation real quickly and just show you a map um, that that we created, and and I'm sure you guys have have heard of and, and seen all the the redlining information that's been in the, um you know been in the news recently um but this is this is maps that we created now this is of, of philadelphia um and these are the on your left hand side this these are these old home securities map these redlining maps um and you can see you know the the red and your yellow areas were your grades c and d um you know your redlined areas if you will um and you can see how systemic racism left its legacy in in present day um when you compare those red and yellow areas you know to to the children's elevated blood lead levels in philadelphia um you know the 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 overlays are stark you're you're looking at basically you know the same map um, and, and then we put this up against EJ screen for an example of how, you know, we don't always have this amazing blood lead level data that we have in Philadelphia and specific and definitely not at the census tract level. You know, most of the time we're getting blood lead level data at the county level. Um, so to get it at the census tract is, is very powerful. Um, and you can see how when you don't have it, right? EJ screen is a great proxy indicator. Um, you know, so this is, EJ screen is, and this is pulled out, you know, this isn't within the web application. This is pulled out and utilizing it within my own GIS. Um, you know, but we always, we like to show these maps of, you know, examples of systemic racism has obviously left its legacy. You guys probably saw the New York Times expose that where they utilize city of Richmond, for example, and you know, looking at this, the redlined areas versus you know, and, and heat heat island effect and, and sweltering heat. Um, I just saw another example of a map between your redlined areas um, in Oakland and um, trips to the to the ER because of asthma. And again, I mean, you are looking at the same map. Um, so to, to to make these connections um, and to tell this to tell a story. Um, you know, map visualization is, is, is really powerful. 
Um, you know, and EJ Screen is, is one of the tools that's, you know, that helps kind of visualize this information. You know, when, when we show these series of maps to people, you know, you can't help but be like, whoa, like this, yes. I get it, and EJ Screen is is a good you know is a good proxy indicator uh, when we don't have you know again that great blood lead level data. Um, but it you know the indicator unfortunately the the environmental harm indicator really doesn't matter when you're looking at past redlining. Um, the 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 unfortunate truth is that a lot of times they they align directly. But yeah, that's just another example of how kind of how we're taking EJ screen information and, and utilizing it kind of outside a, a normal uh, context. Well, I'm going to pick on uh, Lisa and Jalen. I know we're working on some projects that I, I do believe this tool will help us identify some of those areas that we're looking at. Uh, so we can get together offline to play with this some more. I agree. I think this is a really cool tool and I know with Lisa and her um, evaluation background, I think this is going to help us pick out some data um, to see um, perhaps the reasons why behind um, some of the issues that uh, are having uh, taking place in Petersburg. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that sounds great. And please, you know, please keep me updated. We'd love to hear the, the different uses, um, especially outside of EPA. Uh, so yeah, you know, even, even if you don't, I'm not saying I need to be involved in the project by any means, but um, you know, if, if you can keep us updated on, on those uses, we'd love, we'd love hearing about them. Well, yeah, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the, um, the presentation. Um, I think this is much needed, uh, and we have a new partner in Petersburg, the Environmental Justice League, and um, I'm going to talk to Dr. Comer about, and there are some other groups that I think would be interested in this presentation as well, uh, in terms of how they can use it. So I'll talk to Dr. Comer about perhaps uh, setting up um, uh, more in-depth, maybe half-day training. Um, I think this is important information and uh, to have some other community groups involved. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, thank you. Just one quick question. Um, and I'm sorry if I missed this by chance, but like how you have this right here in the middle of the screen, it's a census track. I know you talked about the blocks, but is there a way, because I know Lisa has um, information on particular census tracts in the city of Petersburg where uh, there's a particular concern and focus for the grant that we're working on. So is there a way to make sure to pull that, um, you know, outline that as you, is that the redlining that you're speaking of? No, that um, so redlining actually that was um, these are just these were areas designated in the 30s um, and redlining was was outlawed in the 60s um, because of of its uh, delementary or the, the negative effects. Um, but you can go back and um, you don't have to look at the information via via the block group. Um, so you can actually, um, let me zoom back in here, you can select um, a census tract if you would like. Got it. Perfect. So you could, you could see, um, you know, that, that larger, you know, that larger area um, than, than the block group. Okay. 
And also, you know, block groups fit within census tracts. So you could also analyze the individual block groups within, you know, within those census tracts. It would probably only be, you know, two or three at the most. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no more questions, I guess we can bring it to the a close just a pinch early. But um, any questions afterwards, feel free to email me. And if I can't answer it, I will reach out to Matt. Um, and then I will also be letting you know when the next series, because we're going to, there's so many powerful tools in it that we're, we're going to have to just break it up into smaller workshops like this so that we can talk about it all. So we will be getting that information out, hopefully, soon. And um, Dr. Comer, this video will be re uh, put onto our YouTube channel within about two weeks or so after we do the, the captions. And um, so anything you missed, you can go back and relook, rewatch it and share it. Feel free to share. Yes. Just uh, I think this is the correct channel. Yeah, I'll put it in the chat here. If you just go to YouTube and you search uh, VSU College of Agriculture, it should be the first result. Or you can just use this link. All right. Well, again, I thank everyone for coming. Um, if you, I will stick my email in the chat here. If you, in case you need to reach out. But the ho hopefully, I will do the same. So I uh, thank everyone again, and uh, you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Well, it's not evening yet, but rest of your morning and rest of your day. <laughs>